So it's been a while since I've done a video on Game Gears, and this one is specifically one that does not red light boot. So if we turn it over and turn on, you can see there's no red light boot. So the guys have had a look at this already and can't get this working. So I've done a bit more work on the wiki as well on the red light boot since I did the last video. And we'll run over that and see if we can find out what's wrong with this. You'll notice we've disconnected the clean screen. There's no need at the minute. There's literally no red light. So we're not going to see anything. Same with audio. We need to just focus purely on red light boot for now. So if we go to retro6.wiki and take a look in the getting to red light boot section, you'll now see there's quite a lot more information in here on how to test uh, than there was before. There's a significant amount more. So let's just run over this with this specific game gear and see if we can find out what's going on. Because there's so many places to look for red light boot, I've done this too long didn't read section here, so we can just read through this. Basically, I mentioned for a start, it's important to note that the audio ICs, all the aluminium caps, the LCD, MPU, work RAM, and video RAM are not involved in red light boot. So that means the work RAM, the MPU, the audio IC on the bottom, as well as the video RAM on the bottom, as well as the LCD, the cartridge connector, the audio board, none of these are involved whatsoever in red light boot. You need the power supply, the red light boot circuit, and the A6 working, that's it. You can remove all of the chips and components off the board, but everything else isn't needed for red light boot. So we should focus our attention specifically on the parts that we need. So for this, we start with a good ground because that's fairly common to be wrong. So we want to probe on the power supply, in this case a clean juice, we'll go on the shield. And then we want to probe the red light boot circuit ground, which is the bottom left pin of the resistor, the same for both one and two ASIC, and then a ground on the ASIC as well to make sure we're good. So to start, we'll get the multimeter in continuity mode. We'll go from the power boards ground. We'll touch on the bottom right pin of that resistor that we mentioned. So this resistor here, and you can see we have continuity and the same on the ASIC third pin up you can see we have continuity. So we have good ground. If we keep scrolling, next up is to check the VREF continuity. So on the power supply, we'll go the VREF. So you'll see it's the one, two, three, fourth pin down on the power supply because this one's missing on the board, but still on the connector. And that should have continuity to, in the two ASIC version, the bottom left pin. And on the one ASIC version, it's here. So again, let's check that. We'll go on the fourth pin down of this power supply. So one, two, three, fourth pin down doesn't need to be on for this test and it's recommended to not be on and then that should be the bottom corner and yes we have continuity there as well so next up here's an example of how a test like we've just done we want to now check the VBAT voltages so these are required to bring the ASIC out of reset to do anything and depending on if you've got a clean juice or an original and the battery voltage level there'll be different expected voltages but basically it's a percentage of the input so 5 volts comes in you get 1.58 and 1.16. If 9 volts comes in, you get 2.8 and 2.0. The overall idea is you get basically a staggered lower voltage range going down. And then importantly here, this ground, but we checked that ground was valid. So let's now turn on and check we have 5 volts here, 1.58 roughly, and 1.16 because we're using a clean juice. So we'll use a clean juice. I've just swapped the clean juice because the one I was using is actually modded for 5.5 volts. So just to follow the guide a bit more suitable. I'll just plug this regular or modded one in. We'll measure that we have on the top pin, five volts here. And just so you can see easier, let's just bring the multimeter into view. So you can see we've got 5.1 volts there, 1.59, 1.59, and 1.16. So they all seem okay. So we know all these match close enough. Now we need to check the ASIC pins. So that's the bottom left and then the pin in on the two ASIC. So we should have similar 1.16 and 1.58 volt. So if we check that, you can see we've got 1.16 and the 1.59. So that means the V ref, V reset and V on off are all making it to the actual board and all valid. We have good ground as well. Now we just want to check we actually get 5 volts to the ASIC, which is a fairly common test, but let's just make sure. And you can see we do. We get 5 volts going to the ASIC. So you can see how much easy this guide is now. I've kind of made it follow through so that instead of having to read a lot, you can just follow the guides picture by picture really quickly and help diagnose what's going wrong. So the next test will require the oscilloscope. 
So for that, I'm just going to tack on a ground wire. Grip on the ground probe of the oscilloscope. And now we're free to probe around. So let's just start by making sure we have clock, which we do there. I just speed up to 100 nanoseconds. You can see we have clock. So there's a nice stable clock, 32.215 megahertz exactly, really smooth. So that's what we want to see. And then if we go to this guide, we want to make sure we've got valid clock, which we've just seen we have. We can check it directly on the ASIC pins, so XTL1 and 2, which I need to upload a picture there to show you the pinout. But it's the top left corner, 1, 2, 3rd and 4th pin down. So if we go 3rd pin, 4th pin, you can see the lower amplitude and the higher amplitude. So we've got both of them pins. We'll check the sample ASIC pin, which also outputs a half clock signal semi-square waveform. So every clock rise, it outputs a change in amplitude, giving a half clock speed of 16.11. Again, I need to show the pinout on that. But if we go back to the reading pins, we'll see the sample pin is midway here. So if we look for these two vias, one sticking out, one sticking in, the sample pin is there. So it's 13 pins up, 13. And we can see we're getting absolutely nothing there. So pin 13, outputting nothing. Go back to clock to just make sure it's working. Yep. So the sample pin is just sitting at sort of 0.7 volts. So that's not a good sign for this because this ASIC outputs the sample pin, this specific one here, not this one. And it's doing nothing. So chances are this ASIC is dead. But let's just carry on anyway. So we don't have the sample pin. What about C clock and V clock? So these are... 3.579 megahertz C clocks and 10.74 megahertz V clocks. And as you'll notice here, for these to work, you don't need work RAM, MPU, video RAM, anything like that. You just need the V ref resin on off voltages, which we confirmed were valid, and it should be outputting the clocks. So we go down one pin, you can see the XTAL1, next pin XTAL2, next pin is C clock, which is nothing, and V clock, nothing. So it's definitely looking like a completely dead ASIC at this point. But at least this is a good way to help diagnose and confirm almost definitely that that's the problem. We've got a valid clock, so it's getting the signals it needs. It's got the reference voltages it needs. It's got the 5 volt in it needs. It just isn't coming out of reset, I presume. So if we just check reset pin, yep, obviously not coming out of reset. And so far, I've not really found anything else that causes this bar, I think, a short. So we just read the notes here, out of reset. If the ASIC receives the 5 volts, the VBAT, RES, and on-off voltages, so basically all them voltages, uh, and it doesn't come out of reset, which it's not, then it's typical that you have a dead ASIC, which we can confirm with C clock and V clock, which we just did, or sometimes as shorts or dead passive components. So with that in mind, let's just look to see if there's anything obvious for shorts. So this is a short that's meant to be there. Doesn't appear to be any down that side. None down that side, none down there, none there. No, nope, we're looking all good there. So this is looking like a dead ASIC. I'm just going to remove the ribbon out of the way. And as a last ditch effort, I'm just going to reflow all the pins on both ASICs because there's really not much else I've ever found this to be when the ASIC doesn't respond at all, unless these two can't communicate with each other which then would probably cause that, but I've never tested really on a working one yet. If you remove the right ASIC, does the left one still output the samples? It probably does, and I'll test that at another point. But for now, let's just reflow all these pins. So we'll just do plenty of solder. That looks all good to me. Let's just clean up. So I can confirm looking at that under the scope, there is no shorts anywhere there. So let's see now. And unfortunately still nothing. So I'm fairly confident now that probably this ASIC is faulty. Maybe that one. But I'd say this is the problem. So I guess we might as well just try and hot swapping off this board. Let's just firstly prove that the ASIC on this board is acting the way I expect. So this is just a random board I've pulled out. 
So you can see that Xtal 2 has a wave. And interestingly, Xtal 1 doesn't have a wave. So on this board, Xtal 1 doesn't show anything, but Xtal 2 does. So maybe that's the reason for this delayed on, because that I don't think is right, the Xtal 1 feedback. But ignoring that, because we're going to lift this anyway, you can see there is the C clock, and there is the V clock. So it's got the clock signals. And also, interestingly, it doesn't have the sample output either. So this is missing sample. It's missing XTAL1, which might be the pin for sample, which might be the cause. But it has XTAL2, and it also has C clock and V clock. So, not sure what to make of that. It's sort of a mix between some signals there and some signals not. But we do get power on. So let's transplant this one anyway, because... It's clearly in a better state than ours, and we'll learn something by doing it as well. It's the old one off. Place the new one on. And just remember, don't turn this on too soon. So you want to be able to touch these chips and leave your finger on before you turn on. And at the moment, this is still too hot to do that. You could do all this work and then turn on too soon and end up killing the ASIC because it will short out. So patience at this part is critical. Just spend the time cleaning the flux off the board while you wait for it to cool. Flux comes off much easier while the board is hot. So it's the perfect opportunity to give the board a nice clean. And that's now cool enough to hold my finger on and not have to move it off. So let's see now, do we get red light boot now? And there we go, we have red light boot now, which we'd expect because we have the new ASIC on. So it was a bad ASIC. So now the question is, if we scope again, do we see those missing signals on this board? So the XTAL1 and the sample that we're missing on the other board, that might indicate that the sample is somehow linked with XTAL1. So let's just turn on and let's probe XTAL1. So you can see there's XTAL1 now. XTAL2 is back. There's C clock. There's V clock. So we have all them. Do we have sample? Yep, and we have sample. So every pin is now there. And with everything reinstalled now, let's see if we get game load. No, so we've got game border and backlight, you can see that come on, but no game load. So what I typically find with uh, when this ASIC dies is normally the MPU dies as well. So save probing, we've diagnosed that successfully. This is normally quicker to just swap than it is to probe if you have one spare. So considering we've just whipped it off this board, let's just whip the MPU off and do a quick MPU swap. And it looks like this has already had some flux on, so someone's probably already reflowed these pins at a guess trying to solve the problem. And again, while it's hot, let's take that time to clean up the flux in the area. And then we won't turn back on until we can hold our finger on here without it burning, which at the moment it's a little too warm to touch. So let's just give that a minute. And then I'll cool enough to touch. So fingers crossed, do we now get the game to finally load? Oh, nearly, we're getting somewhere. Just try. So now we're getting green screen, which means the MPU is possibly running, or it could just mean bad soldering, or it could mean workaround. So it might be that almost this whole board's died. It might be that even that ASICs died. 
Again, out of quickness, I'm just going to swap this RAM over. Bad RAM's normally very hard to diagnose anyway because it will simply be intermittent. I don't think we're dealing with a bad trace here, which is what we can probe after. So probing for the RAM just to look if it's good or bad, same with the MPU, won't really give you much information anyway. The only thing we'd know from that is bad traces, which we can always look for if it turns out to be that. So I'm just going for a lucky pass here by just trying this RAM. But you can see it's literally minutes to swap, so. Quick clean up. And then again, just wait for this to cool down and we'll test once more. And they're nice and cool now. So let's see if that did anything. And no. So we could be up to now game read stage where it's trying to read a game and the MPU is now behaving differently. But we also have the suspect second ASIC. So this is where now I decide to either swap the second ASIC or probe for the game read cart across every single pin. It's equally likely to be both, but considering this died and this definitely died because it went from nothing to a green screen, which is normally the sign that then it's trying to do something, I'd say it's likely that everything on this board died. Maybe somebody injected the wrong voltage because if that's died and that's died, the likelihood is the other A6 dead. So in this case, I'm going to opt for quickly swapping this one out as well. So you've seen me do the last one, so I'm not going to bore you with that. I'll just swap this and then we'll come back and check. And that's now the second A6 on again. I've gone ahead and connected everything up. The only thing we haven't swapped now is video RAM. But considering that's died, that's died, that's died, and we're suspecting that's died, video RAM might well have died as well. Let's just take a look. There we go, finally. So we've got audio, that sounds okay. Let's just have a quick check, it works. Yep, all seems good. Don't see any artifacts on the screen. So I'd say that is finally working. So I'd say after a very long process of finding out the first A6 dead, making a presumption then the MPU's dead, which turned out true, and then it turned out that the second A6 was also dead, we finally got this resurrected. You can see the benefits of having the wiki being able to tell you and pinpoint which chip's dead. And we basically pinpointed the A6 for sure. And I'd like to still work on methods to pinpoint when the MPUs are bad and the second A6 bad. So I will keep the faulty chips and do more diagnostics and try and find ways that you can actually pinpoint and know for sure that certain chips are dead. The MPU, however, seems to be if the left ASIC is valid and you still get no screen whatsoever, it's normally MPU next. But I'll try and find ways to prove that without a doubt as well. But hopefully you enjoyed this. There was partially diagnostics, partially hot swapping at the end because we made the presumption if one chip had died, the others had, and it turned out to be true. So that saved us some time diagnosing. And we get to see another Game Gear live for another day. And although we revived this Game Gear, we effectively just had to use another working Game Gear that had a bad PCB and use the working chips on this board. So it's still better than two dead Game Gears. So that's it for this one, guys, and I'll catch you in the next.